1972, Francis Ford Coppola's mafia epic, The Godfather, was released. It broke box office records, won huge critical acclaim, and helped revive the ailing Hollywood studio system. The Godfather's become part of the popular culture now. It was more than just a movie. It changed the way pictures looked, it changed the way pictures were cast. It was a seminal moment. To this day, I don't know that anybody else has ever achieved it. The Godfather launched the career of director Francis Ford Coppola and relaunched the flagging career of screen icon Marlon Brando, starring as the aging, brooding mafia don. You don't even think to call me Godfather. Instead, you come into my house on the day my daughter's to be married and you ask me to do murder money. But the making of this gangster classic was more dramatic and brutal than the movie itself, sparking real-life mob violence across America. Bombarded by mass protests and a bitter campaign of intimidation, The Godfather was almost never made. Bob Evans, the head of production for Paramount, was threatened, as was his wife, Ali McGraw. When we kill a snake, we chop its head off first. Those threats were real. Even worse, a genuine Mafia godfather vowed to stop the movie by any means necessary. If he wanted to stop it, there was no way to shoot him. I told Al to fuck a disaster. Left with no choice, Hollywood struck a historic deal with the mob. But as filming commenced, the streets of New York exploded into a fully-fledged Mafia war. We were shooting a movie, and they were shooting it out on the streets of New York. This is the untold story of the godfather and the mob. Without the mob being involved in making the Godfather, there'd be no Godfather. The Godfather is the story of the Corleone Mafia family and the corruption of its youngest son, Michael. He is sucked into a violent world where cold-blooded murder is an everyday occurrence. But The Godfather, the greatest Mafia epic ever made, had an inauspicious start. In the mid-1960s, Mario Puzo, the man who would write The Godfather, was broke, reeling from the commercial failure of his first two novels. The man who never had too much success in his life. He wrote a book called The Fortunate Pilgrim, it's a masterpiece. It won a book club award. It was really a, a work of art, a real piece of literature. And uh, uh, it, it, three people read it in the whole world, you know. Everyone who had read the book said, Mario, there's one character in that book you should expand and do another book on. And that was this dawn in the book. The Fortunate Pilgrim featured a cameo appearance from an aging mafia don. Puzo realized that this character could be the basis for the bestseller he so needed. The timing couldn't have been better. Real-life Mafia godfathers such as Carlo Gambino had been thrust into the spotlight after a series of high-profile FBI investigations. Such operations are tied in with prostitution, with narcotics, and with more violent forms of underworld criminal activities. Puzo decided to exploit the public's newfound appetite for the mob. There was a hitch. He knew nothing about the mob. So he headed to Las Vegas, which by the late 1960s had become the Mafia playground. In the Sands Casino, he met the man who gave him first-hand knowledge on the inner workings of the Mafia, pit boss Ed Walters. Mario Puzo was a little fat guy who used to come in the, the Sands and other hotels. He was a stone gambler, loved to gamble day and night. He'd spend hours there asking questions about Sinatra and the mob, and he knew very little about it. That's where Mario Puzo picked up all his research. He used the stories that he'd heard and wove them into the Godfather story. I don't think anybody expected it to be the success that it was. It became a huge international hit. In 1969, Puzo's new novel, The Godfather, was published. 
it became an instant bestseller, confirming the public's appetite for all things mafia. But despite the book's global success, Paramount Pictures, who had bought the film rights, vowed it would never make The Godfather into a movie. Absolutely no one at the studio believed in the future of this picture. This was a movie nobody had any faith in. Paramount saw The Godfather as too great a financial risk. Like the other Hollywood studios, it was in dire straits, reeling from the loss of cinema audiences to television. Clearly the audience had changed substantially, but no one could figure out what the new audience was. On top of this, Paramount was still recovering from the high-profile box office disaster of another Mafia movie. Paramount had just come out with a dreadful picture called The Brotherhood, starring Kirk Douglas, which was a disaster. They determined from that that nobody wanted to see the Mafia. They sat on this book until we got involved in it for over one year. During that year, Puzo's book sold in its millions. Paramount knew it had to make The Godfather, but wanted to minimize the risk. What Paramount really wanted to do was capitalize on the name of the book, The Godfather, based on the name value of this mega best-selling book without spending a lot of money on it. They were going to spend somewhere around two and a half, three million dollars to make the film, and they were going to use all people who really needed work. Paramount began to assemble its low-budget dream team. Loitering on the back lot was Al Ruddy, an up-and-coming young producer. I had just done another movie at Paramount. It was one of the few movies that came in under budget and ahead of schedule. This was just unheard of at Paramount. No one came in on budget. With their minuscule budget in safe hands, Paramount and Ruddy then approached a young director. Francis Ford Coppola had all the qualities they were looking for. There was one important reason why he should do the picture, namely, he was broke. Frankly, I believe they hired him because he was cheap. He was born to do the movie. There's nobody else who could have done that movie. In 1970, Paramount announced that Puzo's The Godfather was finally to be made into a movie. They had no idea how traumatic the next two years would be. News of the film would enrage a powerful civil rights organization run by a real-life mafia godfather. He would vow to stop the film by any means necessary. He wanted to stop it. There was no way of shooting. They wouldn't get any cooperation. Hollywood and the Mafia would do battle on the streets of New York. In 1970, ailing Paramount Pictures put The Godfather into production. It would become a gangster classic, but Paramount saw it simply as a way to cash in on Mario Puzo's best-selling book. It was done for under six million dollars, which in those days they were doing movies for 20, 25 million dollars at Paramount. Restricted by a tiny budget, Paramount wanted to update Puzo's 1940s story of a New York Mafia empire to the present day. The setting for the film was going to be translated to the early 1970s, and they were going to shoot it either on studio sets, which would have been terrible, or in a city other than New York, because shooting in New York is always more expensive and more problematic than shooting anywhere else. But director Francis Ford Coppola was determined to preserve the authenticity of Puzo's classic novel and wanted to shoot in the heartland of the Italian-American mafia. Francis Coppola absolutely wanted to shoot a movie in New York City, and Al Ruddy wanted to shoot it there too. There was no question it would be better shooting it there than elsewhere. There's no place else that you could get that kind of authenticity. Paramount finally relented, but by deciding to shoot in New York, they were about to face fierce hostility from a hugely powerful organization with Mafia connections. We are righteous, we represent good, we are good, we do good, and we're gonna force you to do good. By the time The Godfather was in production, a newly established New York organization, the Italian-American Civil Rights League, was gaining influence, boasting celebrities, politicians, and the clergy among its supporters. The membership grew in a space of a little over two years to 100,000 members, and that's not an exaggeration. The League's mission was to challenge the stereotype that all Italian-Americans were involved in organized crime. 
Yeah, mafia. <laughs> mafia. The purpose was to combat defamation and stereotyping, especially in motion pictures, uh, movies, television. We were always being defamed, every Italian-American was in the mafia. If you were successful, no matter how hard you worked, you were labeled that you were in the mob. So uh, it was really a good cause when it first initially was developed. Support was so great that when the League held its inaugural rally on June the 11th, 1970, New York was brought to a standstill. There was estimates from a quarter of a million people upwards. A lot of yelling and screaming, a lot of showbiz personalities came, some sang, some told jokes. It was pretty congenial at the beginning. The news that Paramount intended to shoot a mafia epic on the same streets where they were protesting enraged the members of the League. We will absorb anything, fight anything, fight anyone that is discriminating, defaming our people at all times. When The Godfather was announced, the Civil Rights League totally realized that this would never be positive for the Italian Americans. They claimed there was no mafia, that there was no Casa Nostra, and they didn't want us to make a movie about the mafia or Casa Nostra. The mafia is in Italy. How many? I don't know. They're in Italy, they're not here but they were. The League's charismatic and hugely powerful frontman, Joe Colombo, was the head of one of five mafia dynasties that had a stranglehold over the streets of New York. Hero was a man who was undoubtedly the head of a major mafia organization, and at the same time claimed he was fighting for Italian-American civil rights. As far as they were concerned, he was a good-natured, pleasant person who deeply believed in the rights of Italian-Americans. The fact that he was also being investigated on about 12 federal charges for larceny, embezzlement, gambling, and corruption, uh, probably sort of slipped through the cracks. Joe Colombo decided to turn the League's discontent into direct action against the Godfather. The League is under God's eyes, and as long as it does good things, the League will get stronger and stronger, and those who go against the League will feel his sting. Back in Hollywood, 3,000 miles away, a campaign of violence and intimidation began. The threats against Paramount were coming from the League and the mob, which is one entity. There was no distinct, distinguishing one from the other at that time because the mob totally took over the movement. Uh, now, there were renegades. There were guys within the mob who were look, looking to go around and make scores on their own. The first person targeted was the Godfather's producer, Al Ruddy, who began receiving sinister phone calls. They were threatening his life, and that's very scary. I mean, they would make veiled threats about his family and everything else. And yeah, he was really, he was very nervous about the whole thing. I was notified by some people in the LAPD and I'm sure, coming from Washington, but basically locally, that I was being trailed, I was being followed every place I went in Los Angeles. Al, who's in himself a great Italian war hero, decided that he would trade cars with me. One night, my secretary, Betty McGarr, took my doogie out to her house. And in the middle of the night, someone blew out all the windows to the car. <laughs> and left a note where the windshield had been saying that they didn't want the picture made. So I mean, we were getting subtle messages. Bob Evans, the head of production for Paramount, was threatened, as was his wife, Ali McGraw. Bob got a call from the league saying they didn't want to see the movie made, and if it was made, this would be a lot of problems. So Bob said, I'm not producing it. Al Ruddy is. And <laughs> Joe said, when we kill a snake, we chop its head off first. In defiance of this intimidation campaign, Al Ruddy and the Godfather crew moved to New York. They set up offices at Paramount's parent company, Gulf and Western, in preparation for filming. But the threats were becoming far more menacing. There were bomb threats at Gulf and Western's building in New York City, uh, where they had to clear the building at least twice. We knew that the bombs as far as the Italian-American Civil Rights League were concerned, were, were bogus, the bomb scares. We knew it, but you had to respond to them because of the prevalence of all the bombings going around 
around that whole scene. The fear of bombings was well-founded. In 1970, a wave of politically motivated terrorist attacks had swept America. The Black Panthers, a radical black power movement, had been caught plotting to blow up stores across Manhattan. You gotta remember, in the early 70s, the Black Panthers were very active then, the BLA, the Black Liberation Army, was very active then. Weather Underground were very active then. They were actually planting bombs in the Capitol building in Washington and police headquarters in Manhattan. So they took advantage of that, just like they took advantage of the civil rights movement, which started in this country in the 60s. Undeterred, Al Ruddy and his team continued. But by doing so, they walked into the heartland of the New York Mafia. Coppola's determination to stay faithful to Puzo's novel meant shooting in Little Italy, an area under Mafia control. They were unprepared for the hostility they encountered. The location scouts who were trying to find houses or businesses in Little Italy in New York City that they could use to make The Godfather. They would set it up and they would get the people to agree that they would do it. And then when we'd go to that location, suddenly they'd change their minds. Through the League, the Mafia had begun a fresh campaign of intimidation and then extortion of the residents of Little Italy. The Italian Mafia went into Italian grocery stores and, and meat stores and bars and catering establishments and forced them to put their signs in their window. And the people who put those in their windows would have to pay the mob for the privilege of putting those things in their windows. So it was a total intimidation factor, not only of the people who made The Godfather, but also of the Italian-American community in New York City and the surrounding area. Terrified of reprisals, the residents had no choice but to turn the production team away. We had so little money to deal with that every time one of these things happened, it was a major blow to the picture. And so it wasn't just a matter of inconvenience, it was a matter of dollars and cents. Francis, without any permission, came to Mulberry Street to do a test. And Saeed just built this Cinemobile. He had like a main four in equipment. They parked it on the street and went into Umberto's to have lunch. And when they came out, the truck was gone. They were just showing them that, you know, you're not coming here. And he was just doing test shots. It had become obvious to Paramount that Little Italy was out of bounds. And more worryingly, the League's leader, Mafia crime boss Joe Colombo, held an ace card that could shut down the production for good. By the 1970s, the Mafia had infiltrated the labor unions. Within hours, they could organize pickets, boycotts, and all-out strikes. If Colombo turned the unions against Paramount, they wouldn't be able to shoot a single frame. You can't make the picture if the food trucks don't show up and the supply trucks don't roll on time and you can't move your supplies and your people around the city. Nothing was going to move forward past a certain point unless we sat down with the League or the people who were really obstacles to us making this movie. It became very apparent they knew they had to cooperate. They knew they needed a sympathetic mafia to shoot that film, especially in New York. Left with no choice, Al Ruddy had to come face to face with the mafia Don who was stopping the Godfather in its tracks. Desperate to strike a deal that would appease not only the Italian American community, but also the New York mafia, Al Ruddy agreed to meet Joe Colombo at a hotel in Midtown Manhattan. Al goes to a meeting at the Park Sheraton Hotel thinking it's going to be a small group, and what it winds up being is 600 members in a giant ballroom all ready to take him apart. At that meeting, in front of 600 people, Al told them the truth, which was that the movie wasn't going to stereotype all Italian Americans and that there were corrupt Irish people and corrupt Jewish people and you know, corrupt wasps in the movie too. I said, this is not going to be one of those cliche Italian, let's get the Italian gangsters in America, because then it, it's not going to have the broad appeal that worked for the book. But the League was baying for blood. To confirm Ruddy's claims that the film would not defame Italian Americans, Joe Colombo demanded a private meeting to read the script. There was no way that Ruddy could have predicted what was about to happen. 
Down the hallway come Joe, Colombo, and two guys. Lock the door. Joe sits opposite me. Butter sits on the couch. Caesar's on the window. I said, I'm, you are the only person, Joe, who's going to look at this whole script. No one has seen it. I give him the 155-page script. He puts his glasses on. He asked me, like, what does fade in mean? A couple of terms he didn't quite understand. And I realized, looking at him, there was no way, no way, he was going to sit there with 155 pages. So he tastes, oh, God, these glasses. I can't read the goddamn glass. He throws it. He's you read about it. Guy jumps off. Like, Me? Give it to Caesar. He throws it the other way. Now they're passing the script around like it's a hand grenade with the pin pulled out, right? Finally, Joe takes the script and smashes it on my desk. He says, wait a second. Do we trust this guy? Yeah, we all like him. <laughs> I made a deal with him right there. That's how the deal was made. Al Ruddy made the deal of his life. Al Ruddy is probably should have been a godfather. If he wasn't Jewish, he'd be a great godfather. What Al Ruddy made the deal was very simple. Simple. He said, we'll take out any words you don't want. You don't want mafia? We'll take it out. Colombo immediately agreed to Ruddy's offer. The irony was that if he had read the script, he would have realized that the word mafia only ever appeared in it once. There was only one place, one place where the word was used. It said, no guinea gumba wop greaseball mafias are coming out of the woodwork to get Johnny Fontaine that job. So of course they'll mafia. So now the movie says, no guinea gumba wop greaseballs are coming out of the woodwork to get Johnny Fontaine that job. I don't care how many Dago guinea wop greaseball goombas come out of the woodwork. I'm German Irish. So they left all the other der derogatory words in and just took out mafia and they were happy. That was the only mention in the whole script of mafia. I couldn't make an issue of it to let them think they hadn't gotten anything until the movie was finished. The deal looked like it had turned into utter farce, but Joe Colombo wasn't as stupid as he seemed. Knowing Paramount needed to use authentic locations in mafia-controlled Little Italy, he saw an opportunity to cash in. They allowed them to use these premises, apartments, bars, restaurants, but they had to pay for it, and the mob got the money. They gave a pittance to the owner of the establishment, but the mob got most of the money. So the rules, so to speak, were made by the mob. They encouraged the producers of The Godfather to use premises like this that they controlled. When Paramount agreed to drop the word mafia from The Godfather script, just another example of how influential the mafia was in America. Bending under the pressure of the mafia sends a message, at least to somebody like me, who knows the deal, that uh, they're cowards, which they are. Once the deal was made with the league, there's never a problem after that. But Al Ruddy's problems were far from over. News of the deal between Hollywood and the Mafia would spark a media frenzy that saw Ruddy sacked. It was in every newspaper in America that we had made a deal with the Mafia in order to be able to shoot. Fire him and disavow everything he's done. It's OK. The film would once again be in turmoil, and they had yet to shoot a single frame. In order to shoot The Godfather on the streets of New York, Al Ruddy had struck a historic deal with the mob. They were able to put the squeeze on Paramount that they dropped from the script the word mafia. They want the word mafia taken out. Yeah, I said, you got it. Al Ruddy thought his problems were over. In fact, they had only just begun. In March 1971, the day after their secret meeting, Mafia boss Joe Colombo summoned Al Ruddy to the offices of the Italian-American Civil Rights League. He said, we have to get the word out to the community. I didn't think anything of it at the time, frankly. I figured there'd be a couple of people from Italian newspapers in New York. I go to Madison Avenue, and I mean, there's mobs of people with sun guns and... I wonder, what the hell's going on in this building? I got the elevator, they're all going to the same floor. I go in the room and it's ABC, CBS, NBC. The whole world is there. Tell me, tell me. You guys, are you guys? Uh, take one. We're all rolling together. 
Colombo had tricked Ruddy into taking part in a major news conference where Joe's son Anthony explained the deal to the world's press. We found a, a simple way to accommodate what they wanted. And what is that way? The words Mafia and Cosa Nostra not be used in the book, in the movie. Had you reason to believe that they would have used those words had you not intervened? Yes, I would. I believe they would have used the words. It was obvious the press knew exactly what was going on, and they went straight for the jugular. Do you feel at all intimidated? By what? By, by uh, this action on the part of the Italian Civil Rights League? Not only am I not intimidated, but they have been very helpful to me in physically setting up certain aspects of this production. The next morning, news of the deal hit America. Hollywood had shaken hands with the Italian-American mafia. It was in every newspaper in America uh, that, that, that we had made a deal with the mafia in order to be able to shoot. <laughs> the Wall Street Journal had said, mafia moves in on Gulf and Western. The stock had dropped. Ruddy's deal had caused Paramount's parent company, Gulf and Western, an international conglomerate, to lose billions from its stock value overnight. Its CEO, Charlie Blue Dawn, wasn't happy. Charlie Blue Dorn had a temper that was really something remarkable. When he started shouting and carrying on, you could hear him from one floor to the next. Blue Dorn was a screamer and yeller. He absolutely was. He liked to pound the desk and rant and rave. And he yelled and screamed about this fuss over the Godfather more than most incidents. Blue Dorn immediately summoned Ruddy to Gulf and Weston. The writing was on the wall. Charlie was going crazy because of his stockholders. He was just in a panic. Yeah, if he had a gun right there, he would have killed me on the spot. You hack my company. I tried to go legit all these years, and look what you've done. Fire him and disavow everything he's done. It's OK. Al Ruddy, the producer of The Godfather, was out on the street. Once again, production had ground to a halt. Ruddy's sacking was a disaster for director Francis Ford Coppola. He knew that without Ruddy, the mob would never allow him to shoot in Little Italy. Francis Coppola came to Al's rescue, and he went to Charlie Bluedorn and said, look, if you want to make this movie in this town, uh, and you want it to get done in a timely, inexpensive way, it's going to take an Al Ruddy to make it happen. So I come back, and I swear to God, the man had spittle in his mouth. He was one of those. You know? Ruddy, I'm putting you back on this movie. If you talk to one person in media, I would choke you to death. I said, Charlie, calm down. He put me back on the movie. Finally, after a year of torment, Coppola began to film The Godfather on the streets of New York. And the joy and the harmony lasted approximately three days. Back at Paramount, the first scenes of The Godfather began to arrive the studio didn't like what it saw. You understand everything. <laughs> Scenes of the brooding Don, here granting favors in return for respect, were seen as too dark and uncommercial. They said it looked like it was lit with a cigarette lighter. They didn't know what was going on. And they didn't like the picture at all. They said it was unreleasable. And there was a lot of talk there that maybe we'd gotten off on the wrong foot and maybe Francis was the wrong guy. Paramount feared that Coppola was making its money-spinning project look like an art film. Worse still, his insistence that Al Pacino play the lead role of Michael Corleone further antagonized the studio. They didn't want Al Pacino. Al Pacino was a midget. He's very short, and he was very inexperienced in their opinion. And having a short, unknown, low-key actor appearing in the pivotal role in a major motion picture was not what Bob Evans wanted. Paramount's executives were also opposed to Coppola's decision to cast Marlon Brando as the Mafia Don. Even though everyone considered him to be the finest living actor, no one wanted the grief and aggravation that came along with Marlon Brando. Brando was not considered to be a cooperative actor. He was certainly not bankable. And no one really wanted to even consider him, let alone screen test him. In defiance of Paramount, Coppola secretly went to the actor's home in the Hollywood Hills and made an audition tape of Brando as the Mafia Don. 
He changed his looks completely. He changed his jawline by putting Kleenex in his mouth and his way of talking, which is now, of course, famous. And when Blue Dorn saw the screen test, he didn't know who it was. Judge, what are you watching this old guinea? What, what is this? <laughs> when they heard it was Marlon Brando, they freaked out. They glued to the screen. Brando's betrayal was based on real-life mafia crime boss Frank Costello, head of the Genovese crime syndicate in the 40s and 50s. Costello had achieved notoriety after being called before a Senate investigation committee. He had this gravelly voice, had to do with some throat surgery. Anyone who had ever heard Costello and heard Brando's version of a mob boss, they were two peas in a pod. I want you to go tonight. I want you to talk to this movie, Big Shot, and settle this business with Johnny. Now, if there's nothing else, I'd like to go to my daughter's wedding. You got it. Brando's portrayal of the Don convinced Paramount to give him a chance. But his first public performance shot in Little Italy would also be judged by the most powerful mafia boss in America. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people there. A lot of press, but there were just a lot of people there too, just curious people. And it was, uh, it was kind of uh, uh, bedlam, but that's okay. We wanted that. We wanted, we wanted that kind of publicity because that's positive publicity as opposed to some of the other publicity we had that wasn't quite so positive. I was given an assignment by the New York Times Magazine to write a story about it. So I went downtown and I knew everybody downtown. I knew all the restaurant guys and knew a lot of people. And I'm there watching Brando, and that scene was a a great scene where he gets shot. They came to see the scene where the aging Don is the victim of a botched assassination attempt ordered by fellow crime boss Virgil Solozzo. Brando's first outing in mob-controlled Little Italy had attracted attention from the New York Mafia. The mobsters who watched on were appalled by what they saw. They were complaining. They were saying, hey, it's not the way they do it. Look at him. Look at his hat. He's got his hat. He's got it pinched in the front. It's got to be a block. He's got to be a block hat. And the other guy says, yeah, look at the way they, 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 they're holding those guns like they're flowers. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to shoot a guy. And you know, these, these, these guys, I assumed, had experience. Guy comes up to me and he says, why do you make him look so old in all this old clothes? Get him a silk suit or something. He don't have to look like that. <laughs> I mean, they thought he should be flashier than he was, right? But the real judgment of Brando's performance lay with one man observing the shoot from Ferrara's coffee shop across the street. The power just sort of radiated out of that coffee shop all through the street. The whole that whole little community knew that the man was in town. It was almost like a papal visit. In the coffee shop was Carlo Gambino, the most powerful mafia boss of his generation. You would never, ever, ever in a hundred million years if you met this guy think he was what he was. A mafia capo di tutti capi, the boss of all bosses. Carlo Gambino basically was the guy. I mean. The Gambino family was the strongest family in the 70s. I think they had like 4,000 soldiers. Carl Gambino could make one phone call to a commissioner or somebody, and they wouldn't have got licensed to shoot. No, Carl Gambino, another smart thing he did. He realized, let it go. Brando had won the real-life Godfather's seal of approval. After blocking the film for so long, the Mafia were becoming seduced by Hollywood. But to the mob, if Hollywood was to make a film about them, it was only natural that they should be given starring roles. And at the Corleone compound on Staten Island, the Mafia and Hollywood would finally merge during the filming of the seminal wedding scene. The wedding scene itself was the first scene of the movie. It was like three weeks, we were up in Longfellow Road, and they had, you know, a hundred New York police guarding us, and we needed these guests. The families were putting big pressure 
on us to hire some of their uh, their people who wanted to be actors, some who wanted to change their profession from being professional killers to being actors. And so uh, we did in fact hire a couple of people that way. There were clearly people in New York, league members among them, who wanted to be in the picture. And if you need Italian Americans to be in the movie, why can't it be us? The photographer at the wedding and other parts of that movie, that was the same photographer. That was the league's official photographer. Come in. So there was many roles that were gotten because of the League's uh, uh, cooperation with Al Ruddy and Paramount. There was still one major role to cast, that of Luca Brazzi, the Godfather's personal hitman. When mobster Lenny Montana walked on set, Ruddy knew he was perfect for the role. One day we looked around, and here is Lenny Montana. So I went over and I met Lenny, and I brought him over to Francis. He was perfect. He was of the boys, and he was a major player. Lenny Montana was a hitman and a bodyguard for one of the big families. He wanted to change his career <laughs> and become an actor. Montana's first scene was with Marlon Brando, the greatest actor of his generation. The mafia hard man was a touch nervous. Lenny never acted before, <laughs> so Francis said, well, just go sit down and run your lines and we'll shoot it. You can be, so you get used to the camera. So the marvelous moment you see him on the side of Don Corleone, I modern the letter to be the, the hope the male, the firstborn is a male. That was his rehearsal. So he was talking to himself and talking to himself, this big man so afraid, and Francis shot that and realized, gee, that's perfect, because he was really just doing his lines. Don Corleone, I am honored and grateful that you have invited me to your home on the wedding day of your daughter. And may that first child be a masculine child. Lenny was a very powerful man, but on the set, these guys who had an acting role were also scared and so nervous. I mean, it's like acting was more frightening than doing whatever they did in the past. I am honored and grateful. That you After nearly invited. two years of intimidation and backroom deals, the union between Hollywood and the Mafia was immortalized in this historic scene. On the day of your daughter's wedding, and I hope that their first child be a masculine child. I pledge my ever-ending loyalty for your daughter's bridal purse. Thank you, Luca, my most valued friend. Don Colon, I'm going to leave you now because I know you are busy. Brando initially wasn't really into his role, and as some of these real capos, uh, were introduced to him, he began to emulate their mannerisms. So the presence of some of the hoods on the set was good for Brando. It wasn't only Brando who was drawing inspiration from the real-life mafia. James Kahn, who played Sonny Corleone, was getting closer to the mob than most. Jimmy Kahn loves gangsters. If Jimmy Kahn can get a button and be made, and he had the choice of being made or being an Oscar winner, he'd take the button. He always wanted to be a tough guy, Jimmy Khan. Khan was being seen with Carmine Junior the Snake Persico, the underboss of the Gambino crime family. Persico was under scrutiny by the FBI, and by associating with him, so was Jimmy Khan. The FBI began to even notice him being around mob figures, and they didn't know him as an actor because he wasn't a big star at the time. They thought he was a young, rising mob guy. He was getting himself and looked at very carefully by the government, by the FBI. Everywhere we went, restaurants, wherever we would go, there, we, there was the ubiquitous white Ford, which we knew from past experience was the FBI. With the FBI, Hollywood, and the Mafia all converging, it was only a matter of time before things would disintegrate. After warnings from the FBI, the crew would narrowly escape an assassination attempt. We got the word from the FBI not to be there. There was hysteria, pandemonium. There were bullets flying all over the place. And during the last days of production, the streets of New York would erupt into a fully-fledged mafia war. During the filming of The Godfather, Hollywood and the Mafia had become so closely linked that the entire production was under surveillance from the FBI. 
we were watched by everybody. Was the government aware of the FBI what we're doing? I guarantee it. Was the New York Police Department? Guarantee it. The honeymoon period was over. The attention the Godfather was attracting would result in a public assassination attempt. On June the 28th, 1971, Joe Colombo's Italian-American Civil Rights League held their second annual rally at Columbus Circle, New York. Godfather producer Al Ruddy was to be the guest of honor. I had a call the night before the big rally. I just was told very succinctly, under no circumstance am I to be on that day as tomorrow Columbus Circle. And the phone went dead. Crowds of over 100,000 people converged on Columbus Circle, awaiting the arrival of league leader and mafia boss, Joe Colombo. Four blocks away, the Godfather was shooting its final scenes. We were shooting the revolving doors at the same regions, with guys getting killed. Simultaneously, as Coppola filmed this cold-blooded mafia hit, real life would imitate art. I was on the dais, and it was a very big concert platform, and I heard what sounded like uh, three firecrackers going off. And that's what I thought they were, firecrackers. And then I heard screaming. I ran to the edge of the platform. I looked down, and I saw Joe Colombo lying in the street. Joe Colombo, the linchpin between Hollywood and the Mafia, was shot three times at close range. That was a direct hit from the mob. It was engineered by another mobster named Joey Gallo. He figured, I'll get a black guy to do this, and they'll never bring it back to us because we wouldn't use a black guy to do a hit. And it took us about 30 seconds to figure out who did it. Because they whacked him right in Columbus Circle. They whacked Jerome Johnson right at the scene. Colombo's public dealings with the Godfather's producers and his work with the League had infuriated the other Mafia families. He was breaking the Mafia vow of Amerta, meaning silence. They decided he was a liability and had to be removed. Joe Colombo was a pariah in the Mafia world once he became public like he did. He was getting crazy with power and was told to stop, and it didn't stop, so... If there was no Joe Colombo, there was no league, so there was no threat. And within a year, the league was finished. Period. Case closed. Colombo fell into a coma from which he never recovered. He died seven years later. His shooting meant the end of the fledgling Italian-American Civil Rights League and sparked a bitter mafia war. There was a real war going on in New York City between the families and they were shooting it out on the streets of New York. Crazy Joe Gallo was assassinated uh, in Little Italy. Crazy Joe Gallo, the architect of Colombo's assassination, was slaughtered at Umberto's clam house, Little Italy. Just another mob hit that was occurring right at the time when interest in the mob and the Godfather was at its peak. The covers of Time magazine were, <laughs> is art imitating life. You know, they had us with guns and, I mean, it became reality. After two years of intimidation, protest, media condemnation, and a mafia hit, The Godfather was finally released. The Godfather exploded across America. It broke box office records, rejuvenated Hollywood, and was hailed as a seminal gangster epic. It was an amazing, happy time when the movie came out. We used to drive around and watch the, the cues of the people to, because it was such a thrill to us to see so many people going. This was truly a sensation, the first major picture of the 1970s to really hit at the box office. It's the first movie to ever be Gone with the Wind. You know, Gone with the Wind was the box office champ till The Godfather opened. While Paramount celebrated at a lavish premiere, the mafiosi were furious. Hollywood had snubbed them and they demanded to know why they hadn't been invited. 
where are our tickets to the premiere? Well, the last thing in the world we wanted was those people at our premiere. Joe's son, Anthony, called Al Ruddy, demanding an explanation. He said, well, don't you think that's unfair? I said, what do you mean? He said, Al, when Hollywood does a movie about the Army, the generals are the guests of honor. They didn't move about the Navy, the admirals are sitting up front. You think we'd be the goddamn guests of honor on this thing, except us, we can't see the movie. They were really getting ugly about the whole thing. So we decided to give them their very own premiere. When it was over, the projectionist called me. He said, I've been a projectionist for 25 years. Nobody ever gave me a thousand dollar tip. That's how much they love the movie, literally. When the movie came out, the FBI immediately began to notice in its surveillance of real mob figures that the movie was having an influence on the way the real mob act. They started kissing hands, kissing rings, calling each other godfather, treating themselves in a more genteel way. The Godfather, a film initially opposed by the Mafia, was now adopted by the Mafia. It was the ultimate irony. When we come in with the guns out and the whole routine, they got the tape of The Godfather in the television VCR, watching it. They loved it. The score of the Mafia movie, The Godfathers, became the mob's national anthem. If they knew who you were, like in my case, a law enforcement official, they would play it on purpose to piss you off. Right? But it didn't piss us off. It made us laugh even more at them because we knew how ridiculous they were. The Mafia believed that the Godfather legitimized them. It was a legacy Coppola had never intended. Francis was very offended by the fact that the Mafia people took it as a tribute to them. He intended to show a side of culture that he was not terribly proud of, but to show them in, in, in their reality but he didn't intend to glorify them. They had hijacked the movie just as they had hijacked the production. For the mob, the Godfather was now one of their own. Tomorrow night, it's uncanny. Meet the mob family who were dubbed the real Sopranos at five past 11. And next up tonight, it's the fake ones, a double bill. <laughs>